You're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. You'll be amazed at all these wild but true situations that others have found themselves in. Because on this show, you'll hear uncensored, unbelievable stories from the world of real estate. I'm Lee Brown. Let's dive right in. Before you get the rest of the story, I'd love to share a quick message from today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Follow Up Boss, one of the leading CRMs, client relationship managers for residential real real estate, tons of top producing agents, and some of the fastest growing teams out there are using follow-up balls to increase lead conversion, eliminate busy work that you're not doing anyway, and frankly, deliver a higher class experience in real estate to everybody who chooses you as their realtor of choice. So if you're going to keep listening to this, which I know you will, there's more information and a personal review of follow-up balls. For more information, go to followupboss.com slash crazy. Hello, friends. I'm Lee Brown. You're on crazy shit in real estate. And today I've got Marco Kozlowski for you. My mind is still spinning over the opportunity that I'm seeing right now after listening to him. I'm also still feeling really, really, really focused on safety after his story. So buckle up, enjoy the episode, leave us a comment, and I'll see you on the other side. And Marco, welcome to the show, and thank you for coming on. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Tell my audience a little bit about you, where you came from. Give them a little bit of insight as to who Marco is. Well, I'm originally from Montreal, north of the United States, and I came to uh, the U.S. to not be a concert pianist. I used to be a a magician and a, uh, yes, a magician and a musician, both. And it was very difficult to make uh, any money at all in the uh, music industry. In fact, I got married when I was 18, had four kids at 24, stayed home dad, absolutely loved taking care of my kids. It's my passion. And I was struggling to make money all the time. And I was frustrated about that. And I thought, what can I do to put food on the table and not mortgage my time? And I actually saw an infomercial of all things on how to buy and sell real estate, be an investor, and decided to give that a whack. And since it was a US infomercial and I was living in Canada, I thought, hmm, I'll give it a shot as a Canadian buying in the US. And it was a struggle. It was hard. I had to learn a lot. But it all worked out. Eventually, uh, learned how to buy properties using no money or credit since I didn't have any. And that was back in 1999. So I've been at this uh, almost 22 years now. Okay. So I got to ask you a quick question. mm -hmm. Was that infomercial, the old Carlton Sheets thing that you run at 3 a.m.? I hate to say it, but I was sheet head. Yes, that was correct. Awesome. (laughs) Long time ago. Because, you know, we joke about that, but a lot of people actually, if they dig into it, it was a great way to get started. It's just, as you know, nothing's a get rich quick opportunity. There's get rich the hard way and do the hard work. So anyway, what did you do with that program that got you started? What was the first thing you did? I like lease options a lot. I started with lease options. For those that are not familiar with the lease option, it's when you take a property and you lease it and then you actually like a sandwich lease option. Really, I should amend that. A sandwich lease option is when you lease a property, you look for properties that are for rent, see if the landlord is interested in actually selling it. And then you sell it to someone else that gives you a deposit. So it was a sandwich lease option. So I got, I paid the landlord $700 a month and I got a new tenant for $1,000 a month, made the $300 spread and got a deposit from my future tenant, future owner, I should say, because they have the right to buy the property. Not sure if I'm getting too technical here, but yeah. So I got a little bit of cash and I was able to make some cash flow. And I thought, wow, this is really neat. And any money I made, I actually reinvested in my education. I uh, was pretty maniacal about learning from as many humans as possible because I knew that if I knew more, I could make more. And started, like most people, in single family. And I had massed quite a few properties in single family exclusively. Then I went actually into luxury property. I thought, if I'm going to make a little bit on a small property, I'm going to make a lot on a big one. So I started doing options and auctions on very large property, multi-million dollar assets, where I would make not a few hundred dollars a month, but tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars on each asset, which was very exciting. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that, because as you know, almost every investor that talks about their business is talking about the opening price points, the people who are on a budget really. And when you're talking luxury, it's very seldom that we even think about that as available for lease, much less lease purchase, much less the space that you're talking about. So 
what caused you to try that? Did you see one somewhere or did you just decide it was an overlooked niche? I just thought it was really crowded. And every seminar, conference, conversation I had, everyone was going after the same pool. And I thought, no one going after. And I thought, luxury. And I didn't know anything about it. I don't come from a very wealthy background at all. And I thought, I'll give it a try. Now, first time I did it, wasn't that good. Second time, got better, but got better. I'm smart enough to know that I'm pretty, I'm the village idiot. And if I keep trying and learning something from the mistakes that I make, then uh, everything will be fine. And eventually I smoothed it out to a point where I was fairly successful in that we weren't leasing it anymore. We were just taking a seller that was quite in need of sale quickly. Either someone that was going through, have large debt, divorce, displacement, some sort of disease, I call it the five death. Whatever the five Ds are, where someone is quite motivated, we were able to control their property through an option, not even the lease, just an option. The price that you're asking for it is not the one I actually want to buy it for. I need to buy it for a lot less. Well, this is the lowest I can go. I'll tell you what, well, I have a team that can actually help and facilitate getting, we have a team of a pool of buyers. If you give me the right to, uh, to market it, I will be able to do that. Now, I wasn't a real estate agent. An option allows me to control the property without ownership and have the right to market it. So I optioned it and then controlled it and then sold it for sometimes two, three figures. And uh, the best one I ever did was 2.4 million. That was something that really shifted my idea of how money was created. And it was a really interesting journey for me. So I was very used to making 10,000. And then when it got to 100,000, and as soon as I did a few million dollars on one transaction, it really changed my paradigm. It was uh, very enlightening. So out of curiosity, when that game-changing property happened, what kind of market conditions were you in? Because as you know, there's a lot of people right now, and we're recording this in October of 21, a lot of people are saying, you know what, you can't make money in this market, so I'm going to wait until the market crashes. And I'm curious about conditions at that time. This is 2006, seven, so it's very similar to now. So right uh, before the, the big... Yes. Actually, that was in 2005. 2005. Yeah. For those that don't know who I am, I invest in 36 states. We buy around 1,500 units a year. Pretty much no way that I just described. Uh, that's just how I got started. And uh, so I don't really believe in my market. My market is anything that can make cash flow, if that makes any sense. I think too many people invest in an area where it's close to them. And if you, I no longer buy real estate as a side note, I buy cash flow because I realized I can't pay my bills on real estate. I can pay my bills on cash flow. And I know too many people that are asset rich, cash poor. And if you buy the right cash flow and have that something makes $100,000 a year and it costs you $40,000 a year to finance it, you make that extra 60. You make the spread. So once I got that, I wanted to buy as many cash flowing assets as possible and just find the financing to plug into it. And I found a solution. I'm sorry, I'm talking a long time, <laughs> but uh, I found a solution called asset based lending. And I know you're going to ask me what that is. And I'm sure as a listener, you have no idea what that is, but I'd be delighted to explain it. But I'll take a breath so you can ask me a question. I'm just hoping everybody wrote down that statement that you don't buy real estate, you buy cash flow, because that's definitely a mindset. And if you're 25 years old, you probably do start buying real estate. You buy your primary residence and that doesn't cash flow, but you want to start with your foundational pieces. But somebody that's in their 50s or 60s and realizes that you can't rely on the government is definitely more apt to look for cash flow. And frankly, if you're in your 40s and you're tired of working for corporate America, that's how you can retire yourself early with what we call mailbox money. So it's a mindset. And I love that phrase. So talk to our folks about, well, first of all, tell them what you buy now so they can get a flavor for it. Because you mentioned you've moved on past single family, which is where a lot of people start their investing journey simply because that's what they know. What are you buying now so they can get a mental picture? Great question. I buy anything that cash flows, hotels, motels, multifamily, do a lot of multifamily, more hotels recently because of during COVID is a really good time to get into uh, very discounted assets. Just as a sidebar, you make money on the buy in real estate, as you know. So as the market goes down or up, you want to find the pockets that are not as adversely affected by the economy of what's going on. So hotels, motels, mobile home parks, multifamily, assisted living facilities, memory care facilities, storage unit facilities, pretty much anything that has the ability to have third-party management, because there's no way I want to manage any Jerry Springer tenants ever. No interest in that whatsoever. So we have 
extremely skilled management teams in place, and they're actually incentivized to not only help us optimize the properties, because what we do is we take them down as, uh, I hate to say it cheaply as possible, but as inexpensively as possible at the right price. Most of the assets that we buy are at least 20 to 30% off in this economy. So most think it's impossible to get a discount, but off market is really where to go. You don't want to get properties that are on the market because it's already too late. Generally, there's obviously some, even a blind squirrel can find a nut once in a while. There's always a good deal somewhere. But yeah, so you want to buy at the right price. And if you have the right lenders, which I empower people to, uh, to do, I absolutely love helping people get financed for something they never thought they could because their credit is either bruised, either bruised or they just don't want to have the risk of buying this big asset. But the lenders that we use are non-recourse. That means they can't go after you directly. They're asset-based. And asset-based is instead of you qualifying for the property and having the credit necessary... It's the asset that has to qualify. So it's the cash flow of the asset. So the lender will look at, okay, the thing is worth a million dollars. We're going to lend you 700,000. So that's your budget. So if you can get this million dollar asset for under 700,000, they'll lend you 700,000. So if you got it for 650, you could close the property, roll in the closing costs, and even pull money out of closing for reserves and some money for HIP National Bank if necessary. So there are lenders out there, in fact, hundreds and hundreds of them, and we just started our own fund, in fact, to do this as well, where you can get money as long as the deal is sound. So if somebody has questions about your resources, you've got, we're going to provide that link at the end of the show, correct? Sure. Absolutely. So you about that fund. So I want to backtrack for a second because you talked about hotels and motels, and during COVID, they have been hammered. And just a reminder, y'all, when you're thinking about commercial real estate, It can be seen as one item, but commercial is wildly different than residential because warehouse is so different than industrial or medical or hospitality. They've all got a different setup. And so thinking about hotels and motels, you may see warehouse and industrial in your market just on fire because of, say, cannabis becoming legal. But then you look at business travel is not back yet, and it's going to be a while before it does come back, and it may come back in a different format. So my question for you, Marco, is if you're buying it below market because it's a sector that's really been hammered, how do you function until you get the cash flow in place? Because it may be a while for those room vacancy rates drop to the level they were before or where it makes any sense. Well, we're buying it based on cash flow to begin with. So if the hotel was worth $5 million when it was doing well, and it's now, and it cost $5 million to build, as an example, because most people look at building cost versus cash flow cost, and it only is now worth because of the cash flow a million dollars, we're buying it for less than a million, not for five. So the cash flow that we're stepping into is financed exactly at at what's affordable. There's going to be a spread where there's no matter what we buy it for at any economic level, whether it's up or down. So if it's worth $10 million, I know I'm using big numbers and that might scare the pants off many people, but just to step back a little bit, if I can make people feel better, I don't come from a very wealthy background. I've been doing this now for 22 years and I have a lot more comfort in larger numbers. But whether it's 10 cents, a dollar, $10, $100, $1,000, they're just zeros. That's all it is. So if you just remember that no matter how large or how expensive a property is, if you understand the mechanics of that, and it's just education because fear stands, most people are afraid of things. And all fear stands for is forget everything and run, just get out of there. And you don't want to be afraid of things because that just stops you from doing the things that you really should be doing. I heard a saying that I absolutely love. It's our destiny to be successful, but our choice to fail. And if you, yeah, really powerful. And if you just make choices to learn things and be curious about what's possible, your life can completely change. I come from a town of less than 30,000 people in Canada that only speaks French. And because I was curious and I was able to accomplish some things that I'm quite proud of, and I was able to take care of my family. And now my passion, we buy quite a bit, and I'm sorry I went off track to answer your question, but just know that you can accomplish anything if you just get the right tools, mindset, and education, and surround yourself with people that are just phenomenal at bringing you up versus putting you down, because I think that's really important. Okay. So I told y'all that I would do a review of Follow Up Boss, you know, because I'm your friend in real estate, and I did. Now, you know, there's a blue million CRM out there. I mean, if you go to any Facebook group, every realtor is like, which one should I use? Which one should I use? 
And you know that these CRM, which are client relationship managers or customer relationship manager, whatever you want to call it, it's truly a system that's just designed to help you know what to do next because you're very busy and you're a multitasker in real estate and with all those different tasks and balls up in the air. You need something to help you stay on track. And that's what follow-up balls does. Now, when you save a name and a phone number in there, that is basically a Rolodex. Follow-up balls is going to take the names and phone numbers and also help you know what to do next. So you can maintain these relationships with your neighbors because that's what this is about. Real estate is not about serving just prospects and clients. It's about taking great care of your neighbor's needs in real estate. And if you'll use a tool like follow-up balls where they remember you, oh, they might even call you when they're ready to buy or sell again or when their mom and daddy do or their best friend or their kid and you want to be top of mind, that's what a product like follow-up balls will do for you. Truly, it's going to change your business when you start paying better attention to people. They don't have to know you use follow-up boss, but they'll totally understand that they are being heard by you. So now there's a free trial for my people because you're loved. Go to followupboss.com slash crazy. No credit card is required. And frankly, because you're my people and we made an ask for you, follow-up boss said, yes, you get double the free trial. That's actually enough time to log in, put some pieces in it and watch it change change your business as it has for so many realtors and teams nationwide. Again, go to followupboss.com slash crazy to start your free trial today. That's an excellent rabbit trail to go down. So high five for that. Because we all need to remember that. I mean, truly, like the it happens in real estate all the time. Agents don't even think about higher price points because they didn't grow up in it. They don't live in it and they feel like it's different, but it's not. It's just bigger. It's just, like you said, another zero. I love that phrase. So of course, the premise of the show is the crazy shit in real estate. And when you buy things like assisted living centers and storage units, you've already mentioned Jerry Springer and mobile home parks. I'm dying to know of all the states you've operated in and all the real estate you've done in 22 years, what's the story that you still can't believe it happened that you came out the other side and that you didn't get out of this game altogether? <laughs> There's a few. There are quite a few. I think the worst one was when I first started. I did a sandwich lease option and it was in the same neighborhood that I lived in, right around the corner. And I had rented this property to a retired cop and he hadn't paid in a while now. And now being Canadian, I didn't understand the discipline necessary to make sure the tenants paid rent because if you cut them a little slack this month, then they're going to pay with excuses next month and they're going to keep just, you can't cash excuses. Very, very difficult. And I had an obligation to my landlord, my own, because it was a sandwich lease. I have a lease with the owner and that tenant has a uh, lease with me. So I'm sandwiched in the middle. That's why it's called the sandwich lease option. So he didn't pay. And I was like, oh, it's okay. You know, I just didn't understand the business. I was very, very new. I felt bad that he has, was going through a hard time. And after three months of not paying, I was like, man, like, I, gotta, <laughs> I really have to get paid or I'm going to have to kick you out. I'm going to have to start eviction. And it was very difficult for me to say that because I was a very non-dominant, very passive person, just let people walk all over me. And real estate really taught me how to stand up for myself big time. And I'm sure you can appreciate that as well. If you're in the business a while, you meet some crazies that push your buttons and push boundaries all the time. So finally, I'm like, this is it. So once he got his first notice, he called and says, hey, I'm sorry. I got something for you. Why don't you come on over? And I was like, okay. Now my wife was like, don't go, don't go. Just get him out. I have a bad feeling about this. And I thought he said he's going to have the money. So I'm excited. So I drive around the corner. I knock on the door and he lets me in. I walk into the property, which is my first mistake. And as soon as I go into the property, he actually starts punching me <clears throat> as hard as he can. He grabs me and he starts, yeah, he starts trying to beat the crap out of me. And it was terrifying. Now, I'm not a small person and I did judo for a very long time. In fact, I was uh, <laughs> considered for the Canadian Olympic team. So I knew how to defend myself. I was just so shocked that I couldn't believe what was going on. And I flipped him over my shoulder and he landed on the kitchen island and it basically just started crashing. I was absolutely terrified. I get out of there and then I hear gunshots. Now I'm scared <laughs> even more. I get into my car, I get out of there and I'm shaking. My adrenaline is going so high that I'm shaking, I'm shaking, I'm shaking, I'm shaking. I don't think I've ever told this story to anyone. So I'm shaking, I'm shaking, I'm shaking. My wife is going, what the heck? What happened? You know, what's going on? I was attacked. I heard pops. I think, am I shot? Am I shot? So I can't even speak. 
there's so much adrenaline pumping through my veins. And my wife is like, call the police, call the police. So she gives me the phone and you know the old phones with the big antenna. So I'm, I'm shaking. I hit 911. And as I'm on the call with 911, there's a police cruiser that goes by. And I thought, oh, they're already here. I wave him down and he steps out and he's like, are you Marco? I'm like, yes, I am. Do you live here? I said, no, I actually live over here because I had kind of followed him over. And he puts me in handcuffs and says, you're under arrest for the attack of your tenant. What? Like, what? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He called, his buddies? he called his buddies, didn't he? He was a retired cop and he knew that the first one in 911 was the one that actually got was in favor. And that's apparently how it works. And I was absolutely terrified. I had never been arrested before. So I was arrested. I was put in a cruiser and the guy starts asking me questions like, oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Canada. Oh, do you go there often? Yeah, I go back and forth. I invest in real estate. And uh, he says, well, do you actually own this property? I say, no, I have a sandwich lease option. So I'm explaining to the cop because I'm Canadian. I just talk to people because they ask me questions. And so this guy is basically building a case against me, right? And uh, I was supposed to, so I was in, <laughs> it was really funny because they put me in jail and I was supposed to get a court date within 24 hours. But because I said I was from Canada, the guy said I was a flight risk. And I actually was in jail. I didn't even get to see a judge for almost four days. And it was not the most pleasant experience. I've never been arrested since and actually uh, paid an attorney to expunge my record. So technically, I've never been arrested on paper. But uh, yeah, it was- You it was never probably, should have been. I should have never gone into the house ever. Right. So that was the mistake that I made. And I should have gone with someone or two other people. His wife was there as well. And she testified that I had attacked him versus the other way around. And this is prior to Google, right? This is way before Google. This is back in 1999, 2000-ish. So this is way early in my career. And she had to go online and find, she went to every county record to find this guy's name. And he had apparently done this in four other states to four other landlords that were actually charged and convicted. So there was a pattern. And if it wasn't for my wife, I would have been cooked. So we put a case together and he never showed up to the final hearing. And yeah, that was... Probably the craziest shit I've ever had to personally go through. I don't know if that counts as, as a good story for this podcast, but I hope it does. It's a great story, but it's also horrifying. But you've already pointed out what I would point out, which was you never go by yourself. But all the way, gentlemen who are watching and listening, when we talk about safety in real estate, whether it's you as a property owner, a housing provider, or as a real estate professional, it's not just the ladies we're talking to because... Anybody by themselves can be a target, especially if they've got more knowledge than you do, which is frankly what happens a lot with tenants. They know exactly which loopholes to play with. Like this guy knew to call 911 first and make you out to be the villain, which is insane. But you also have to think about that intuition, right? So your wife had that hair on the back of the neck feeling, I don't think this is good. We all have to learn how to listen to that instinct because, I mean, stay at home, dad, you got some babies to think about, but we always, I think, want to believe the best in people. You wanted to believe he was going to pay, but huh, you're lucky to come out of that alive. Yeah. I'm very blessed. I'm very grateful. And I've had a few harrowing things in my life and that was definitely pretty crazy. But the rest of y'all go get some judo training or carry concealed or something <laughs> because you need to be prepared for breaking a kitchen island, which I haven't heard of anyway, throwing an, somebody on the kitchen island and yep. breaking it. So um, he was obviously tough and so were you. <laughs> well, he wasn't talking. He was punching. And because I broke the island and it was in his house that he had a lease on, I was actually charged with a felony over assault and battery. And I think damage over $1,000 in Florida is considered a felony. So it was nuts. It was really, really scary. Uh, that was probably the second most terrifying experience I've had in my life or close to the first. I have quite a few stories of tenants that are <laughs> one 80-year-old tenant stabbed a 90-year-old tenant from jealousy. Was that in one of your assisted living centers? No, this is actually in a mobile home park. I was like, woo wee, you got a pretty smile with all them teeth. It's a very interesting group of uh, characters in that park. And there was an 80-year-old man that was dating a 90 year old woman and they were living side by side in a trailer and he was uh decided to see this i guess a 75 year old other 75 year old at the other end of the park oh my god and the 90 year old woman was so jealous that she stabbed him and sadly he died and she went to prison so it was unbelievable it's just unbelievable i know it's wrong to laugh but to think about <laughs> it's, 
it does it's, it is wrong to laugh and i feel terrible i'm going to hell like i don't understand why it's funny but i just it brings tears to my eyes because you can just like i'm coming for you rufus and it's just so how fast do you move them with a the knife how much arms i wasn't there i wasn't I wasn't there just hear this from my management team and like what this is ridiculous it's such a bad csi episode but i'm surprised they haven't made this one yet because that would be a whole new angle to take in that series indeed okay so marco before we wrap up the episode i want you to share the one thing that you've learned in your real estate journey that you wish you had learned earlier in the process i'm going to say asset based lending versus credit based lending an asset based loan is something that is lent on the cash flow or in the value of the property exclusively so you don't need money and credit to buy it and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lenders that will let you acquire properties of all shapes and sizes that have great cash flow where the cash flow is $100,000 they'll lend you the $40,000 it costs for the money and you make the spread so you can make millions of dollars a year just by understanding how asset-based lenders work and operate and what they need in order to get the money. And my passion now is helping as many humans as possible tap into that source because having no money when I grew up and always coming from a place of can't afford it, can't afford it, can't afford it, looking at a menu from not what I want, but what I can afford, I was a very humbling experience when your kids are looking at you and say, I want this and you want to provide, but you can't because you don't have the money. Now I just say no because they have to earn it. So the mindset has shifted as opposed to if I can't afford it and it's good for them, I'll buy it. But if they haven't earned it, there's no way they're getting it. Don't want spoiled little brats on my watch. Good job. And- good job, Dad. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm only good at 11 things and that's one of them. I think, I hope anyway, we'll see, see how they turn out. So yeah, asset-based lending, it's very unknown and it almost makes people think it's impossible. You need credit to buy assets. I'm sure you've heard this a million times. Don't have the money, don't have the credit, can't do it. You have the money because it doesn't have to be your money. Their money is always available on the right deal. Just remember that. And had I known that earlier, I would have retired not in my 40s, but in my 30s. So he's told y'all that twice. So if you didn't grasp it the first time, listen the second time, Just sometimes your biggest growth comes from that one something that doesn't sound like anything you've ever heard before is the place to go get the education and learn. And even if you never try it, you could learn it and tell somebody else because growth comes from unexpected places. So we'll include all of Marco's links and social handles and ways to contact in the show notes for this episode, because I know if he tells you right now, you won't even write it down and that's fine, but that's why we have show notes. So you can follow up and go find something else out for yourselves and quit letting fear run your financial life. I love the little angle he gave y'all a few minutes ago. So shake that off and go learn something new. Marco, thank you for coming on the show and giving us a frankly important safety story and also some great insights on a new angle to take to make things better. I appreciate you so much and everyone just crush it. Again, it's your destiny to be successful. It's your choice to fail. So suck it up, people. Go get it done. Click on the links, follow up with Marco and be more successful. Make sure you give us five stars, hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Okay, now don't forget to go try follow up boss so that your business can continue to expand in professionalism and then you can meet some more crazy people yourself. I really appreciate follow up boss sponsoring this episode, but mainly I appreciate them for giving y'all double the free trial time with no credit card required. So make sure you go to followupboss.com slash crazy and then let me know what you think. I'll see you guys next time. As always, I'm so super thrilled that you joined in for more crazy shit. And if you're a realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular human being who happens to have an unbelievable story that you need to tell the world about, or frankly, you just need to one up the story you just heard, then make sure to DM me on Instagram at Lee Thomas Brown or tweet me at Lee Brown or frankly, any social network where you hang out. I'm there. And if you had some fun, then you totally won't just subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. 